Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I can see we already have participants filling in. I'm very excited today to be your host for our February webinar, which is called Biomimicry, Learning from Nature. And we're very excited to have our guest speaker here today um, from the Biomimicry 3.8 group. So um, as people are filling in, I want to remind you that, I mean, I think I think a few people have already started in chat just telling us where you're joining from today, what part of the world, what state in the US, what province, uh, wherever you're coming from, we'd love to hear. Um, but I wanna, while people are doing that, um, just go over our attendee guidelines. So we've set this up where only the panel will be able to um, share audio today. And that's just to keep it from becoming too chaotic. So you will be muted. Um, and, but we really want to hear from you, and specifically if questions come up for you that you'd like us to cover in the, in the panel session at the end, there is a Q&A tab in your Zoom navigation bar. So the chat is where you can converse with each other. Um, maybe some of us will be um, trying to answer a few simple questions there throughout the talk. But if you specifically have a question, for our panel that you'd like us to discuss in more detail. That's where you can can share that with us. And we have um, our wonderful tech support folks that are keeping track of those questions. So so please uh, ask those there and just enjoy yourself here today. This I've been really excited about this, this is a couple months in the making for us to get to to chat with them um, with Anne about biomimicry. So we're just going to do um, some introductions of the panelists today. And then um, Anne Laforte will be providing the bulk of our um, presentation material, and then we'll go into about an hour long um, Q and A session. So we expect this will be right around the two hour mark, um, maybe a little bit less today. And uh, here is our um, first chance to hear from Anne. Would you please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about? Um, your organization here, and then we'll go to Elaine, and then and then I'll introduce myself at the end. Sure. My name is Anne Laforty. I am a soil nerd. Um, I am also a project manager and a biomimic for Biomimicry 3.8, which is a uh, global consulting firm that works on, on biomimicry design projects. And I am coming to you from Pasadena, California, uh, from the territories of the original peoples of the Tongva Nation. Is that supposed to be a cue for me to start introducing myself? <laughs> Um, so I'm Dr. Elaine Ingham. I am the founder of the Soil Food Web School. Um, have worked with people around the world on um, many aspects of what the bio, uh, the food web is and how the biology is different and changes as we go around the world. So um, and come and visit us on the Soil Food Web uh, website. Uh, we have lots of very interesting uh, things for you to read and see. We've got some cartoons in there. We have some um, uh, examples of people who have been very successful with their um, um, bringing biology back to the soil and um, improving uh, their production systems and reducing cost. So all of those those things. And um, if we're uh, going to be talking about the ancestral lands, this is, the place we are in Oregon is in the ancestral lands of the Kalapuya Indians. Thanks so much, Elaine. So um, some of you may uh, recognize me from other webinars. I often get to um, be a partner in crime to what's going on here at the Soil Food Web School. I'm a, a content creator and science communicator um, here at the school. It's been about a year and a half since I joined the team. And um, I'm in the Boise area of Idaho in the US, which is the ancestral lands of the Shoshone and Bannock tribes. And very excited, I met Anne back in October in real life um, at, a, at a, a fungi conference or uh, workshop. I'm not exactly sure what you would call it. And right away, we wanted to get her 
um, on one of these webinars to talk about my biomimicry, um, which is really, I'm going to actually stop sharing here, Anna, I'm going to turn it over to you um, because we're so excited uh, for the presentation you're bringing us today. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be with you all today. Um, as I said, my name is Anne Laforty. I am that soil nerd. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit more about me at the beginning um, after the introductory slide. Uh, but before we begin, I again want to acknowledge that I'm meeting with you today from the territories of the original peoples of the Tongva Nation and traditional ecological knowledge wisdom holders and their ecological land stewards have been doing biomimicry since before the term biomimicry was coined by Janine Benyus in 1997. Janine is um, a co-founder of the, the company that I work for, Biomimicry 3.8. And I am only at the beginning of my journey, um, and I really want to honor the dozens more of generations who were and are connected to land and to this land. Uh, their wisdom and deeply woven bond with nature really inspires my study of natural patterns and our relationships with each other. And uh, really the historical and continued cultural and generational genocide of indigenous peoples across Turtle Island and really across the world um, have decimated lives and communities, uh, but they have survived and they are still here. Um, and so I asked the question, how might we uplift and support their work to continue to create conditions conducive to life? Um, so with that, I would like to jump right in. And so here uh, on the left, I have a picture of <laughs> my friends and I um, doing some fermentation. And on uh, the right is, is me out in the field earlier last year. So I journeyed from being a foodie to a soil nerd. After high school, I went to college in Northern California. And then shortly after that, I moved back to Chicago. And I was a foodie and I was really excited about the colors, textures, and flavors in food. And um, at the time, my friend here in the green asked me to join her to help her create a urban ag project. And uh, we had about a quarter acre on the back lot of a community center. And it was a lot of fun. Um, I was very new to gardening, but once again, I was a foodie. So the, the perspective of being able to become a regular at local farmers markets, I really focused on eating within the seasons. And I learned about fermentation, preserving the harvest. And I really wanted to know, okay, but how do we get those colors, textures, and flavors into the food? I mean, I know we have to grow it, but like how, what's, there's, it was very black box for me. Like I was like, okay, how do we do that? Um, and I found out that as, as we have here, the nutrient density really depends on the health of the relationships in our soil microbiology, micro, microbial communities. Um, and so Really, the soils require, as many of you know, microbes and fungi, moisture, oxygen, organic matter. Um, and with those, and um, it, it can become a, a soil sponge that will cycle nutrients into food. And that is really, um, it's, that's at the heart of what really is so deeply interesting to me, is um, we are at our core foundation, uh, soil dwellers. Um, we eat what comes from the soil, we are housed by what comes from the soil, our entire lives really um, are, are built on that foundation, literally and figuratively. <laughs> um, and so when I learned about that, uh, I, I remembered back to my time in California um, and about all of the, the produce that is grown here, now I'm in California. Um, grown in California, like you can see on this chart, it's it's pretty astronomical. And actually, I read something today that said something like 90% of winter produce is grown in the Central Valley of California. And so I remembered all of those fields um, being left dry and bare during the off season, left to severe erosion, requiring heavy pesticides, fertilizers, irrigation, tillage, to be able to even grow like a reasonable yield. Um, and because of that, when I learned that these microbes really needed to sort of drive this, this you know, nutrient density in our foods, I felt 
almost like a magnet was pulling me back to California. So I did move um, approximately, I guess, seven and a half years ago um, back to uh, California. And I now live in Pasadena in Southern California. And I also wanted to just say that this journey is not a straight line. Um, so many of you might be sort of, maybe you're like me, maybe you're not, which is which is fine. <laughs> Maybe you do have a straight line journey. Um, but for me, I wasn't really sure once I got to California, like, okay, but what now? Um, I didn't have a degree in anything agriculture related. I had a poli sci degree. Um, and so I was like, okay, so I wanted to get some experience. I took a whole bunch of workshops, trainings. Um, I took some uh, workshop from the Bionutrient Food Association, from the Savory Institute. Um, I went to Singing Frogs Farm for their no-till workshop. I learned about rainwater capture and worm bins. And I mean, pretty much if it sounded like it might be interesting, I was like, hey, I'll try it, right? Um, I'm, I guess I'm a bit of a generalist there. But I think um, there's there's lots of opportunities out there if you are looking for them. Um, and really, I think a lot of it is also about building relationships with those people who are running those uh, organizations and, and those events, but also the other people who are attending them. Um, because they're just like you and me, they also want to learn and connect um, and really you know, get our hands dirty in this work. All right. Uh, so I have also done um, a bit of the Soil Food Web School coursework. I finished the foundational courses. I attended an in-person compost workshop with Dr. Elaine and the Catalyst Bioamendments team. If you get a chance to do that, I highly suggest it. 10 out of 10 would recommend. Um, and I am in the middle of my certified soil lab tech program right now. So let's jump in. What is biomimicry? I get asked this so much. <laughs> I mean, of course, right? Um, so biomimicry is learning form, learning from, and then emulating natural forms, processes, and ecosystems to create more sustainable design. And so here I have that it's the conscious emulation of nature's genius. So conscious, it needs to be on purpose. It's not enough to design something uh, without nature's inspiration and then come back around later and be like, oh, you know what this reminds me of, um, of the natural world. No, that's, that is not biomimicry. It really requires that active seeking of nature's guidance during the design process. Um, second, emulation. So emulation, we're not really copying being, we want to be inspired by the patterns. We want to use it as a template based on how it works. So the functional strategy of how does this solution work in nature and how can we apply that to our designs? And third, nature's genius. So nature has been doing this work um, for 3.8 billion years. So that's why um, the company I work for is called Biomimicry 3.8. So that is how long nature has been doing research and development on everything you see in the world. Um, and so what if we could take those patterns and really use those um, years of R&D for design guidance um, across all beings on earth? It's really, uh, it's exciting. I, I sort of the possibilities are literally endless. Um, and so it gets me really excited. So again, as I said, uh, we use form, process, and system, and um, different scales from literal to metaphorical. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, and that's when we're asking nature to be a model. Um, and then we also can ask nature to be our mentor to ask nature the question, like, how might you solve this challenge? How might nature solve this challenge, right? Um, and then we can also look to nature as measure. So how can we compare our designs to how well nature has solved this problem? Um, so for example, if we are doing ecosystem restoration design, how might our design line up against an intact, healthy ecosystem uh, from this, this local biome? All right, and uh, before we move on, I just wanna uh, grab your attention for a second to this second bar on the left. And you see these little tiny hooks up here, these long stems. This is a very close up shot of a burr. So one of uh, the sort of original uh, early modern 
biomimicry examples is Velcro. So inspired by the burrs uh, that he found on himself and his dog after a hike, Velcro was invented by George de Mistral in 1941. And being an engineer and an entrepreneur, he found these burrs, he examined them under a microscope and realized those hooks that I showed you in the last slide were easily able to loop, uh, to hook on to fur or fabric and allowed that burr to adhere very well. And so this sparked the idea of, hey, maybe I could mimic the structure as a potential fastener. And um, so I don't know. Uh, so the, the French word for loop is velo. And the French word uh, for hook is crochet. And so he combined those two words into Velcro, um, and he started the Velcro company in 1959. And since then, as many of you know, I'm sure, Velcro has become integrated into our daily life and re has revolutionized the fastener industry. Okay, so this is my favorite example. It's, um, okay, so many of you may know about the Japanese bullet train. It actually used to be shaped like the front of a bullet. And um, as it would go through tunnels, it would compress the air from in front of the train. And as it would exit the tunnel, it would create a sonic boom, which was very loud and disruptive to anyone, human or non-human beings that lived near nearby. And so you can imagine that would be very frustrating to have that multiple times a day. <laughs> um, and so the engineer... Eji Nakatsu uh, was also a bird watcher, and he was inspired by the kingfisher bird that could dive into water without making a splash. And let me go to the next slide. So here we have a picture of that kingfisher just about to dive in. He ended up redesigning the front of the train to mimic the shape of the kingfisher's head, which removed the sonic boom. There are also another couple um, examples of biomimicry in this train, but just to simplify it, um, you can go back and check it out. Uh, there's lots of um, internet videos about this, but it is just so interesting to me how that small change of the shape of the front of this train was able to, as I said, remove the sonic boom. And also now the train can travel 10% faster safely, and it uses 15% less energy. So again, um, you can see the shape mimics the shape of this kingfisher's head. Okay, some other really cool soil-related biomimicry. Um, the Land Institute uh, has been doing perennial uh, plant breeding uh, experiments for quite a while. Um, and they're they're working on grains, legumes, and oil seeds to help farmers reduce their expenses and dependence on costly inputs. So perennials do not need to be replanted every year. They can protect the soil from erosion while improving its structure. They can um, contribute to ecosystem health by ret retaining uh, nutrients and sequestering carbon and supporting water better water fit infiltration. There's like oodles of reasons why um, it would be fantastic for us to find more perennial options. Um, and so that is the work of the Land Institute. Um, and if you haven't already, I highly suggest that you check them out on the internet or give them a visit. Okay, this one it's going to connect with all you uh, soil food web lovers out there. Um, this is a design for a brewery that, uh, so the Zero Emissions Research and Initiatives team has designed this brewery model, um, and it, it has been used for a few um, pilots in Africa, I believe. Um, so this brewery model uses waste materials as inputs for other processes to create a circular economy based on the structure of a food web system. And so um, we can look at some of these pictures um, as I go through this. So the brewery produces high quality certified organic beer, and then the spent grain from that brewery uh, provides the substrate for growing mushrooms, breaking down the spent grain and making a nutritious food for animals. And then um, vermiculture, we can use the, the mushroom substrate um, that is left over after the mycoculture to feed worms that produce compost and become feed for chickens and fish. 
Um, there's also a biodigester. Um, so with inputs of wastewater from the brewery and organic waste from other operations, anaerobic bacteria in the biodigester can actually produce methane gas that will then be used as a heating or power gen generating fuel. There's also aquaculture. Um, so the water and nutrients from the digester can feed the algae, such as spirulina, phytoplankton, other aerobic organisms, um, which then become inputs to the polyculture fish farming. Um, there's also opportunities for agriculture, animal husbandry, a maltery, and even heat recovery. Um, and so I highly suggest you check this out if you're interested in food web designs. All right, so nature is generous and uh, as, as we know, um, and so we asked the question, how can we emulate nature's generosity to build soil, store water, regulate temperature, filter water and sequester carbon? I think a lot of you guys are already doing this work. Um, and that is, I mean, y'all are my people. <laughs> <laughs> um, the soil food web, uh, the, the work that the, the soil food web school is doing to educate everybody about how we, we really need to focus on the cycling of nutrients, um, and that community in the soil really does these things. Um, and it's, it's basic, but it is fundamental. Um, and I think that there's a lot of farmers, and gardeners who don't yet understand this. Um, and so I, I really I really support the work um, that y'all are doing here. So thanks for having me. Um, so regenerative soil advocates aim to improve soil health and fertility by working with the natural processes that occur in the soil food web community by promoting the growth and activity of microbes, fungi, and other soil organisms, we can aim to create a diverse and thriving ecosystem that supports healthy plant growth and improves the overall health of the soil. And so when we're doing that work, that design is based on nature. That is biomimicry work, right? Um, so if we're thinking about like, what are the functions of each of these organisms in the soil, even if we're zooming in and looking at, oh, there's all these different functions of nematodes, um, we need to think about how they function in relation to the other organisms in the soil. And so when we're trying to fix a problem, we need to consider how to mimic those functions or trigger those functions or support the organisms that should be doing those functions in the soil. Um, and actually, before I go on, I just want to read this quote at the bottom. When the forest and the city are functionally indistinguishable, then we know we've reached sustainability. So that is really a big goal of our work at Biomimicry 3.8 is really trying to build designs that are ideally functionally indistinguishable from nature. All right. Um, so... You know, the standard process for cleaning up polluted soils um, before a building is built on a site is to scrape and dump. Um, removing the soil from the site and hauling it sometimes hundreds of miles away to be dumped and deserted, baked by the sun. Um, and there's actually this process, bioremediation process, um, that uses live organisms such as microbes, fungi, plants, worms, um, to break down and remove pollutants from the environment, uh, including contaminated soils. And so um, before construction begins, this work needs to happen, but really it needs to be considered in the design and the planning, even before one shovel hits the dirt. Um, and so it's really the work of our time, I think, to push that work earlier upstream in construction, um, whether it's on a home that we're going to be building or pushing for our communities to um, require that work to happen before development happens on um, community, uh, you know, neighboring land. And uh, also considering how we might be able to, you know, have building sites that could become pollinator friendly. Um, you know, by incorporating the practices uh, that provide habitats and resources for pollinators, um, while also supporting biodiversity and ecosystems health, and honestly, by including 
biocomplete compost um, for maintenance, I think would be a really uh, great improvement on the way we do this work today. And also, of course, while storing water and carbon, I live in Southern California and we have really big issues with water. Um, when it rains here, the water uh, rolls down the street and into the gutter and into our river, which is um, almost completely cemented in and then picks up all of that pollution along the way and then rolls out into the ocean. And so um, with all of our paved land, uh, it's really difficult for that water to get back into the soil. And also uh, if it's been uncovered and unprotected, it has that soil cap. And so um, that soil surface is hydrophobic. And so how can we really create land, even if it's on a building site, that could uh, be able to store water um, and ideally also store carbon. And so again, um, with, with our, our design considerations, but also our maintenance um, and using biocomplete compost applications, uh, I think there's some really good opportunities for our future. And of course, how might we produce food on that land? Uh, we can enable culture and connection to the land while we also are able to share this information and teach about soil healing practices that can grow nutrient dense foods that are also culturally appropriate to the community. And how can we allow nature to migrate through? Making pathways for fauna to weave together broken landscapes supports migration and provides spaces for animals to more freely roam. Um, yeah, the, so uh, the plant ecologist, educator, and author, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, has said that in restoration of water or land, we must focus not only on the aesthetics or the systems of a design, but we should also consider the biocultural and reciprocal needs of a place. How can we better support the gifts and responsibilities of the beings that once lived there as well as those that have persisted in place against all odds. And, um, you know, those beings have adapted alongside the changing conditions. And so how might we open our minds to their wisdom and their generational survival? And of course, how might we humans become producers of ecosystem services? So ecosystem services are the benefits that people obtain from natural ecosystems. Um, there are ways in which nature supports human well-being and sustained life. And um, so you can see here, we've got um, a plus sign on the water capture, um, perhaps providing air cleaning or creating oxygen. Um, so when designing our farms, homes, office buildings, communities, anything, um, we can give back by innovating ways to provide ecosystem services through restoration of damaged natural cycles and also through innovative technology. And so in biomimicry, we compare our designs, as I mentioned before, to those in nature and ask, are our designs creating conditions conducive to life? How might we make them more circular so that wastes feed back into the system as inputs? How might we incorporate non-toxic materials that do not require extreme heat, pressure, or toxic chemicals to produce? How might we reuse heat that was produced by human machines to support greenhouses or heat nearby homes? Okay, so this, I, here I'm gonna have, I have a couple examples of um, social innovation, biomimicry. Um, and so we use biomimicry in a metaphorical application to more optimally design our human systems. And so here, quorum sensing uh, is the ability of individual organisms to be able to sense others of their own kind and others of different kinds, to be able to build a quorum or ag agreement uh, to turn on coordinated functional processes allowing them to be able to do things that they couldn't do on their own. And so this example um, on the image is honeybees. Um, honeybees 
perform quorum sensing through their highly democratic hive location decision making process. Um, it's really cool kind of blows my mind um i got to learn all about it during my studies and if you want to learn more about that you should check out the book honeybee democracy by dr thomas dyer seeley it's a really great one it not only talks about hive uh decision making but also um like the experiments of of understanding what the optimal hive might um be shaped or uh how far off the ground it's really cool um so quorum sensing also happens in soil, as you might have already guessed. Um, soil microbial communities actually release and detect small signaling molecules called autoinducers. And these molecules are produced by individual microorganisms and they diffuse through the soil as long as the moisture is uh, high enough to allow for diffusion. And uh, once the concentration of those auto inducers reaches a certain threshold, so it really is all about that threshold there or quorum, it triggers a coordinated response in the microbial community, such as the activation of specific genes or changes in behavior. Um, and this allows the community to communicate and coordinate their activities, such as the degradation of organic matter or suppression of harmful pathogens. And so how might we be inspired in our lives by quorum sensing, perhaps to improve our community communication and behavior synchronization to meet shared needs and secure better chances of survival? And my favorite, I have a lot of favorites in this deck, uh, mycelium. I am definitely a fungi nerd. Um, so there are fascinating functions of mycelium. They provide us with inspiration for building stronger connections and uh, communication channels in our own lives, organizations, communities. And um, so how might we build networks and relationships that share resources? Um, Perhaps, you know, uh, just as mycelium builds the networks of interconnected fungi, we can build networks of relationships in our personal and professional lives uh, to share knowledge, resources, and support, and, and really diverse relationships with the people in our communities help to create a sense of mutual trust and cooperation. Um, and the mycelium transports essential resources between plants and their individual roots uh, that their individual roots actually can't reach by themselves. And so there's a lot of surface area that the mycelium provides and reach um, so that those nutrients can get back to the plant. And so how might we create mechanisms for sharing resources across our networks? Um, the mycelium also provide protection. Uh, and so they can provide protection from predators and disease, and uh, that can be through communication or it can be physical protection around the root. And so I ask, you know, how might we um, provide protection for our networks, whether that's creating safe spaces, uh, supporting those who are vulnerable or advocating for policies that prioritize human well-being and environmental protection. And lastly, communicating effectively. Uh, mycelium carry messages between plants to warn them of potential threats or share information about available resources. And so again, how might we do something like that? Perhaps, um, you know, uh, trying to tune our frequencies um, so that the messages that we give out are tuned to the frequencies that are uh, <laughs> that are received by others, but also so that we can tune our ears to hear those messages as well. So, um, as I said earlier, we have the literal, um, you know, it could be nanotechnology innovations in biomimicry, but we also have the metaphorical for social innovation, as I was just talking about. And it's really anything and everything in between. So it's at, at all scales and at all abstraction levels, um, biomimicry really is open and, and ready to be part of your life, honestly. Um, you know, if you if you like a certain part of, of biology, you can dig in and look for the functional strategies and try to understand the how of something. Um, so how does this thing actually do that thing or how does it trigger or how does it protect itself or how does it as you know as i said in the beginning how does food get that nutrient density that's what led me to all of this work is really trying to understand that functional strategy um 
And so uh, I just want to come back around and say this is the program that I was trained through. Um, Arizona State University has a biomimicry program. There's a certificate. There's some undergrad um, classes. There's the master's degree. Uh, it's really an amazing program. And even if you don't live in Arizona or even the United States, you can still be a student. It's actually a global program, very much like the Soil Food Web School. Um, it is all virtual and online. And some of my closest and dearest friends uh, from the program are in Germany, Australia, or even spread across the U.S. And uh, a little bit about the company that I work for. This is Biomimicry 3.8, the global leader in nature-inspired innovation services and biomimicry training for professionals. We have consulting, training, and speaking um, opportunities. And uh, so consulting, we have a project called Project Positive. And Biomimicry 3.8's Project Positive is a framework for using biomimicry to create sustainable and regenerative solutions for organizations and communities. Um, as you've heard today, biomimicry is the practice of looking to nature for inspiration in design and problem solving. And Project Positive actually applies that approach to a variety of sectors, including business, design, education. And uh, the framework is designed to help organizations shift their thinking from a do less harm to a do more good approach um, by using nature as a model for creating systems that are regenerative, resilient, and in harmony with the natural world. Um, and overall, uh, Project Positive aims to inspire a new way of thinking about sustainability um, that is based on the idea that we can not only reduce our negative impact on the environment, but also create positive benefits for both people and the planet by emulating the natural systems around us. Uh, Biomimicry 3.8 also offers immersion workshops. Um, this is actually a picture from my kayak in Costa Rica when I went in January of 2019 on uh, an immersion workshop there. And it is really a fun way to engage with biology, learn about biomimicry, explore the natural world, and build your curiosity for the patterns we see in nature. Um, you can find more information about those immersion workshops and pretty much everything else I'm talking about here on the Biomimicry 3.8 website, which is uh, biomimicry.net. I have a couple more slides. Um, we also do have speakers, workshops, uh, team trainings, design charrettes. Um, so design charrettes are like a biomimicry innovation design brainstorm workshop where we provide the biologically accurate biomimicry patterns in simplified forms so that we can help your team actually apply those to your specific challenges. Um, it's, a, it's really a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so if you're interested in uh, bringing this biomimicry to your team, connect with us <clears throat> and we can collaborate uh, to build a program for your organization. And uh, so a few resources I just wanted to share here. This one is a free resource. It is a really, really cool library of functional strategies. Um, so we see this picture here. This is just an example, but um, it uh, sort of bundles together biological knowledge, uh, those functional strategies, innovation case studies. So if you are really interested in innovation and you want to see what people have done with biomimicry for innovation, it's a great place to read all about that. And then there's also educational resources. So if you know teachers who are really into science and like, oh, I wonder what biomimicry is. Great opportunity, <clears throat> great opportunity there. And that um, is run by uh, Biomimicry 3.8's sister organization, which is the Biomimicry Institute, uh, a nonprofit working to educate around biomimicry. And so uh, that website, biomimicry.org, also has quite a few uh, free educational resources around biomimicry. And um, a couple uh, small things you can get on our website from the shop. We have uh, books. This book right here is um, the biomimicry book, Innovation Inspired by Nature. This is Janine Benyus's book that um, she published in 1997 that uh, coined the term biomimicry. Um, we also have the biomimicry innovation, uh, I'm sorry, the biomimicry resource handbook, which I have right here. It is chock full of really cool information, a really good introduction, um, required reading for 
pretty much all of the biomimicry coursework at Arizona State University. Really good opportunity. Um, there's a, uh, a really affordable version digitally if you want to check that out. Um, and then last but not least, this eyesights book. Um, so eyesights are what we call basically nature journaling for biomimicry. And so it's full of uh, different ideas and activities that you can use in your own life, with your family, with your students, with whoever, um, to just start to get a little curious about nature, but also have an opportunity to really connect with, with paper, with, um, you know, different medium around uh, creating art, or, and even really just to sharpen your observation of nature. And uh, there's also card decks. Um, I have, I think, probably four out of five of these. Um, so these are just decks of cards that have um, information. So there's this packaging in innovation toolkit, which is really fun. So if you're interested in um, packaging um, and how we might be able to use biomimicry with that. Uh, life's principles, play deck, life's principles, leadership. So life's principles are the uh, different I guess, rules, simple rules around uh, what all of nature does. Um, and so this is a really good way if you if you don't feel like you can dive all the way into the biology of um, biomimicry, life's principles gives you these simplified, um, I guess, uh, yeah, simplified like lessons or ideas that you can use um, to be able to apply to your work, your life, your philosophy, whatever you're into. Um, and uh, yes, that is it. I just want to say, go outside. <laughs> this is it for my presentation, but go outside, dig into your curiosity. And as you observe the life in the soil and beyond, you know, really, we, we really, as Janine says, we need to quiet our human cleverness um, and look to nature for um, these design ideas. Um, Reconnect with the non-human beings around you. Observe the relationships, signals, and patterns you see. Design your solutions to create conditions conducive to life. Thank you so much for having me. If you want to get in touch, here is my email down here. You can also check me out on Instagram. I am Soil Nerd Alert on Instagram. And if you want to get in touch with Biomimicry 3.8, as I said, our website is biomimicry.net or um, here's our phone number or email address. Thanks so much for listening. I look forward to uh, talking with our panel and answering your questions. Wow. And I wish you could see, well, maybe you can click over to the chat because the people love you. I also noticed that the people love bees and fungi, when those topics came up, there's been some, uh, some real fun sharing of beekeeping books by the group in the chat and just everybody just recognizes how much time and effort you put into this and the quality of your presentation. So thank you, it's been fun. So uh, and I uh, oh, would please. be able to sit in or sit and talk and chat about um, all of the uh, biomimicry going on under the surface of the soil, on the surfaces of the trees above ground. Uh, you know, would, we could probably have a, a few good dinners together to just chat about that. Um, because I, I see that what you call biomimicry, I see it all the time. I'm always talking about that yeah, this is what Mother Nature um, is trying to tell you. And if you don't pay attention to Mother Nature. She's going to dream up something nastier. And so you're going to have to live with that in the next year. If you don't listen to that, she's going to get nastier until, you know, we've got the situation. You gods, it's uh, snowing outside. Uh, <laughs> surprise. So that's so funny. I, I, I think um, one of the things that surprised me is once I started really digging into biomimicry, it was a pair of glasses, a lens that I could not take off. And so, like you say, when you go outside, you look at trees, you see fractals, you see green, uh, you look at the soil, you think, oh, is it covered? Is there detritus protecting this? Are there, are there plants growing? Oh, those plants don't look very healthy. Like it's, it's a constant, uh, sort of, I guess, uh, voice in your head that is really just, it's very clear that it, it's, it's a lens that I can't take off anymore. Mm -hmm. been um 
indoctrinated into the club. And <laughs> so, you know, we we just need to spread that information, you know, uh, tie it together with the benefits to people that if we change the whole way we grow plants, um, let it be more natural. Let it be what nature would have put together. We Nature doesn't tend to grow the same plant in long rows with absolutely nothing allowed to grow on the ground in between. What are we thinking? We're losing all these incredible interactions and, and then we keep pouring toxic chemicals in order to fix what we've broken. Um, yeah. Just learn what nature is trying to tell you and we can have really end all of those kinds of problems so it goes hand in hand with what what you're seeing oh gonna have to sit and draw pictures of models <laughs> well i hope that i can take a minute to do a shameless plug for our soil summit that's coming up because there were so many things in your presentation that just were popping in my brain as related to speakers that I know we're going to have at the Soul Summit that's in March. Maybe I can ask um, Sammy or one of our other tech support people to put a link in chat for people to get to the registration or, or information page about that. Um, in particular, Anne, when you talked about the idea that humans can see themselves as the facilitators of ecosystem services, I mean, that is something amazing right because like during the pandemic when people stayed home and some of our destructive systems were shut down for a while in our in in you know in parts of our society where those run there was this idea of like nature's healing because the humans are staying home and i was like i understand why people feel that way but really are we are we setting it up where like nature is this perfect thing that we shouldn't interact with because we screw it up all the time, or is there a role for us? And we happen to have um, Lila June coming to give a talk at the Soul Summit, and I'll put her TED Talk in the chat because she says, you know, from her, um, from, the, from the tradition of wisdom of the Navajo people, they said, we humans are a keystone species we can make more habitat and space for the other species to thrive around us if we take on that perspective and role. And I think it's something that we just need to be challenged really deeply to understand that so many of the cultures which have already figured out how to coexist and be part of nature, they're, they're still here, we can still learn from them. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I just want to echo what you just said at the end there is we're not separate from nature. Humans are part of nature. Uh, we just need to reconnect with that if we have, have been disconnected. Um, and that's one of the ways that I, I love to sort of enjoy that aspect um, of biomimicry is being able to be out in nature and reconnect with the beauty and also the systems and all, all of it together. But I love that idea of us as, as keystones and how we can really support all of the other species around us. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have some Q and A that's come up. And so I can reshare screen here and, and do those. There was one thing I saw in chat that I thought I might ask you and, um, mm -hmm. and Elaine, what your thoughts are on this is somebody said how like how would you differentiate biomimicry from permaculture and i mm. think that's a, that's a tough question well i think it's it's got to be something along the lines of where you're conscious of putting the um natural system back together again that you're you're actually aware that that's what you're doing and permaculture they do a fair number of things that uh, they're just taught, not without, well, without a really clear understanding of the um, the nature that we're mimicking. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Cause I actually came, uh, once I, I start, I was helped start the urban ag organization. I got really into permaculture and that was sort of the leap from perm permaculture into the bionutrient food association workshop, um, into the soil microbiome. Um, and one of the things that I really wanted was how can I set up my garden to take care of itself? And so I think that there is some definite crossover to the questions that we ask in permaculture um, and biomimicry. Um, I think the difference is really just how deeply into the science are you looking to go? Um, are you looking to emulate natural cycles and relationships and, you know, uh, relationships of their, of their communication? Um, and ecosystems, or again, are you just trying to, you know, design it based on permaculture, which uh, again, some of those probably are in line with biomimicry. It's just a question of where um, sort of the, the deep patterns are coming from. Yeah, I think, uh, I guess, I think maybe that permaculture is focused on some principles and strategies to which I see biomimicry being like an umbrella term, right? That we look to nature for that inspiration. And then in permaculture, they've operationalized some of that and, and borrowed heavily again from the um, indigenous wisdom that is embodied around the planet about, you know, having that knowledge of place and process mm. and form. Oh my so goodness. There's so much, very... there's so much stuff that I wanted to like jam in, into this presentation today. And I was actually, it woke me up in the middle of the night last night. And I was like, I don't have a, pl a place to really talk about the genius of place, but it is a huge piece of biomimicry. Um, so one of the things, if we are uh, designing something that will be set in place, like a home or something like that, um, we want to look to what is the genius of the organisms that live in that place? How do, have they adapted to the operating conditions of that location so that we could try to include those in our design? Um, because those organisms have been there forever, not forever, but you know what I mean? Um, you know, as long as they've been there, they've probably been there. Or, you know, if they migrate, they return to that same place over and over and over again. And so how can we include that genius in our designs by really focusing on a, a hyper-local understanding of place? Absolutely. Okay. I, I think that we probably should answer some questions because I could, I could talk to you <laughs> all day. <laughs> we've been, uh, we've been here taking her time and we should let the, uh, yeah, everybody else have a chance. Let's see if I can just get over to the actual questions. Okay. So, um, Jocelyn asks, are there any examples of biomimicry in the engineering of kelp farm design? It's a very interesting question. I am sure that there are. Um, I haven't studied them deeply, um, but I believe I worked alongside someone who did some research with that. Um, I think it would probably be around ways to design farm systems for kelp growing. Um, you know, whether or not we're using uh, water that is directly washing in and out from the ocean, um, making sure that we are, are, you know, that closed loop idea, if there are wastes that we reincorporate those wastes into the system. Um, but yeah, I, I would guess you could probably go to asknature.org and um, type in kelp or kelp farming. Um, and there's very likely uh, some great designs there. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, this when I read this question, I thought about because um, I I spent a lot of my childhood years in the Philippines, and there are some real issues with like urban pollution streams into rivers, and there were there's been a, a resurgence of or like a creation of a kelp farming industry that's actually cleaned up a lot of those water sources, especially from nutrient enrichment, and I'm like. It's interesting because I don't know that I would say it was intentional. It was just because they actually set up the farms in a way that could be like to take advantage of those smaller and passive kinds of 
um, resources that were coming in there, it just had that beneficial effect in the long run so that there was actually less you know, harm being done to coral reefs and things in the area because the kelp farms intercepted that urban um, nutrient enrichment. Absolutely. I love it when there's the, those unintended consequences that are actually beneficial. That's, that's fantastic. We need more of that. Yes. So, okay, great. Alice um, asks, can either of you imagine that genome sequencing of the various members of the soil food web could facilitate understanding of how they work together and complement plant growth, et cetera? Let's, let's talk a little about, bit about modern molecular genetics here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, I guess, the obvious answer, but really the key to being able to, as you said, um, how they work together to understanding that is really understanding the functional groups and what those functions are and how they are in relationship to each other, um, which is at somewhat of a higher level uh, than the genome. Absolutely. I mean, um, you brought up quorum sensing. And I think that's, you know, and, and the actual activation of different genes that are going on in some of those, um, the emergence of a very complex kind of decision making process, right, out of these different organisms. And there is some really fascinating research out there um, as to how like plant diversity and microbial diversity uh, can actually lend itself towards more cooperation over time within the organisms in the soil food web where maybe there's um, a switching of you know they were competing for the same exact food source and then one of them will actually realize and oh, the population is there of the competitor so what if i just switched food sources and they weren't my competitor anymore right and so we see these really interesting things happening through successional patterns and all that has to be in that genetic world, but I totally agree with what Dr. Elena said. It is, there's a lot of fighting about how to interpret all of that information. And then at the level of the genome sequencing, where you would say what's in like the, the DNA, okay, then we need to sort out how little we understand even how many species of bacteria and fungi are in soil. But then it's also which genes are active and what is the, what's, what's the environmental cue that's causing genes to turn on or off? And it's just, woo, it's making somebody, lots of somebody's careers. But I agree that sometimes it seems very abstract compared to the level of saying, hey, something's broken here. We have dirt. How do we make it alive again? How do we make it thriving, teeming with diversity? Um, those things, go a long way towards a practically, you know, a practical outcome that will improve the way that lively, human livelihoods, landscapes are functioning, all of it. And everything in the molecular world is interesting and valuable, but I don't know that there's necessarily, um, you know, tons that I would say like, oh, we're just on the brink of really understanding it. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it's interesting. Um, the niche dif differentiation, right? That idea of species slightly tweaking when or who they eat um, or where they live. Um, and I think that's such a, a key to this work, of course, uh, the soil food web work, because the more diversity we have, the more opportunity the different microbes and soil organisms can be able to adapt to the changing conditions. So some of them, most of them maybe, are sort of deactivated during times of cold or lots of heat or whatever, but there are some that are still on the job, doing their work, building relationships. And then as those uh, situations change, as those operating conditions change, there are others there who can then flip the light switch on and become active and take over as the initial ones, um, you know, are deactivated. Absolutely. That's why we see systems like the tall grass prairie that have 16 species per square meter being so robust against periodic drought or other disturbances that, you know, can't be avoided in the system is there's always something that will activate and rush into the void 
that is being created by a neighbor, you know, not being able to handle the conditions and dying, right? And yeah, there's just a, I mean, we could talk about a community ecology all day, but I'm we not, do. I'm not <laughs> Everybody bored to death. Well, and, and one of the things we, um, I muted. No, you're fine. No, we can hear you. No, I'm fine. Okay. Um, one of the, you know, when we put plants into the soil, uh, are we putting them in with all of the um, the other organisms, other species, bacteria and fungi, protozoa and nematodes? Are we getting all of that in? And what we see is the more we can pull in a greater and greater diversity, it means less and less stress. Um, the plants that we're trying to grow, we see more nutrition, we see, um, you know, more seed production, it grows faster, it germinates faster. Um, it's not going to be harmed by diseases and pests because it's the nutrient content that has to be present in order for the immune system in a plant to be turned on. Um, so, you know, quorum sensing is that kind of a version of, you know, an example of that. So um, lots of things that we're finding at that kind of higher level, but trying to move things, um, understand the why. Why does things work? Why do things work this way? And figuring those out. And it's like uh, it hasn't been that long that um, 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 James White, uh, ha has found a whole nother way that nutrients get into the root system and it's all mediated by the microorganisms. Mm -hmm. And so... Rhizophagy! You know, <laughs> <laughs> exactly! <laughs> and then another one that he's just been talking about is where the bacteria that get into the plant start moving through all of the plant fixing nitrogen in the case that they've been looking at because you know we we just don't understand nutrient nitrogen cycling all that well and lo and behold look there's yet a third way um to get well actually a fourth way because you have to add in mycorrhizal colonization as well as nutrient cycling as well as rhizophagy as well as um he's showing that we've got nitrogen fixing bacteria throughout the plant's body. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to be giving a talk at um, our um, 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 upcoming conference. Come on, my, my I love it. Soil <laughs> Summit. Love it Here when my go. brain just kind of, nope, not. <laughs> that happens when you're 70. <sighs> so <laughs> he's going to be talking. And so, yeah, a plug for everybody coming to um, see the Soil Summit. Because uh, he'll be talking as well as me, so um, we'll. I'll have to apply some of your um, Mother Nature uh, working to make everything much more like Mother Nature than we have been in the last what you know seventy hundred years, where we've gone down the the wrong pathway, and we've harmed ourselves. We you know, it's a it's a real question of. Uh, how rapidly are we going to be able to implement something that manages to overcome the damage that we've done to the soil? Yeah, I think that's part of what is so urgent to me. Uh, I feel like a lot of people have become apathetic because it feels like it's impossible and nothing we can do can actually matter. But I feel like with soil healing, there's literally something any of us and, and every one of us can do in our hyper local ecosystem, like directly under our feet in our communities. Um, the work is there, you know, uh, I say we got to get busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It should, it's like everyone should take their lawn and put it into production of some other plant that actually has a purpose for it other than you have to mow it every weekend or something um put in may you know put flowers and put food in feed other people if you're getting too much um, production and we can help a lot with preventing the need 
for um, inorganic fertilizers. You absolutely do not need them. It's it's all mythology. Um, so get the biology back in there. And then the biology does it all themselves. All you have to do is kind of oversee it on an occasion. And so, you know, you had examples with lakes and rivers and streams and um, uh, other kinds, you know, bees and everything. All of that mother nature put that together could we please pay attention please please <laughs> wow I, I like hearing the two of you talk about this this is really <laughs> cool um i'm so glad i i guess this is not your first time meeting because Anne, you said you went to a workshop mm -hmm. but wow then we elaine we should have taken you to the mushroom conference <gasps> oh yeah <laughs> Yeah, I well, I, I've worked with Paul and with uh, Peter, um, not not for not for too long, but um, we have the same interests. And uh, yep, someday we'll we'll be doing more with the um, fungi again, with the with the um, you know the, the things that produce big mushrooms or uh, on the sides of the trees. Those uh, yeah, have to deal with some of that. Well, um, one thing that came up for me when you were talking about the wrong pathway, Elaine, mm -hmm. is, um, I mean, a lot of people know that I went to a land grant university. And even though I was hanging out with the ecology folks, there was plenty of coursework I took and professors I interacted with that had that agronomy, chemical agriculture mindset. And it was like, a strange kind of like, oh yeah, the green revolution is the only pathway forward for humanity. Like we would all starve to death if we didn't have green revolution style agriculture. And then it's all these little things that I'm that I'm amazed at. Like when I took the foundation courses and heard you talk about pH for the first time, Elaine, where I was like, they just jammed this idea on me that like you have hundreds of acres and it's all the same pH in the soil. And it makes no sense. Soil is not like that. It's not homogenous. And then you even talked to Lane about how like along that root system, every millimeter, micrometer, the plant is influencing its environment. It's influencing what microorganisms it's interacting with by exudates, by hormones, by signals. Those microorganisms also have their desire to create something different in their environment. And so you, the pH varies at micro scale. And then all of this work that's been done out there to say like, well, you know, you need to have pH exactly here across your whole field because that's the optimal level for the uptake of inorganic nutrients like magnesium, phosphorus, whatever. And then I'm like, they made it way too complicated because they over-engineered it in their own minds about what we have to do instead of trusting this wisdom of the natural system. So thanks, Elaine, for helping me understand that. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Should we go back to answering some questions? Sure. Sure. We, <laughs> we got another 50 minutes, so um, we can talk afterwards too if you all want to stay on the horn. Uh, how does one optimize carbon sequestration within the soil as well as maintain it at an optimal functioning, asks Carol. So I can I can jump in here and say that I I actually I have a very high level understanding of how this works um, from my my knowledge from the the, the foundation courses. Um, but just today, um, a colleague shared actually this morning, um, a colleague shared an article that I actually just also shared with Adam that uh, showed that carbon sequestration was optimized depending on how the microbes died. So if you think, what are all the different ways that microbes could perish in the soil? They could um, be treated with chemicals. They could die from heat. They could die from lack of oxygen or water, or they could be eaten. And so apparently they're seeing that the soil food web and the poop loop that we know about is actually the optimal way to sequester carbon in soil. And so isn't that such a beautiful tie together of like the way nature does it is actually, oh, I don't know, probably the best way. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's, 
when you have the full diversity of the microorganisms for that biome or that re, you know ecological region, um, if you have all of that diversity, then it doesn't really matter what killed the organisms. They're going to die and they're going to become decomposable. But I like to think of it a little bit more as um, it's the decomposition of the organic matter and who is the organism that's going to do that decomposition. We know that the carbon to nitrogen ratio of bacteria is very close, five carbons for every one nitrogen. The food that bacteria obtain is generally going to be much higher in carbon than it is in nitrogen. So this bacterium wanting five carbons for every one nitrogen has to eat this stuff that is 30 carbons for one nitrogen. So that poor little bacterium, what does he do in order to be able to get the proper ratio of carbon to nitrogen in his body? He's got to blow off at least 20, 25 carbons into the atmosphere as CO2. They are very bad at maintaining that carbon um, in the soil. When we look at fungi, for example, and you know, and so this is kind of high level, you know, thinking of, you know, where are you in that biological structure? We know that fungi have a carbon to nitrogen ratio somewhere around maybe 40 to 100 carbons for every one nitrogen. And so when they are consuming, decomposing anything where the CDN ratio is much, much lower than what that fungal hypha required, it's got to take all that carbon in. It needs the carbon and generally it places that carbon along the insides of the hyphae in order to prevent the microarthropods that would like to come and eat that fungus and you know, rip it apart, but they can't do that because that carbon shield inside the hypha is preventing them from being able to get a grip. So they walk off looking for something that is easier to fit in their mouth. Um, and we have to understand those mechanisms. How many people have sat down and tried to understand the mechanism by which these organisms are trying to um, keep everything healthy and happy inside their bodies. So trying to, uh, going back to the, the concept of uh, carbon sequestration, how do you optimize carbon sequestration in the soil? Grow a lot of fungi. You see why the guys like the fun fungal people like me so much because we're um, finding out why we need the fungi in the system as well as the bacteria and the protozoa and the nematodes and the microarthropods and the earthworms and the you know all of those things have to be present if you're going to get stability in your system. So we we want to have um, our area where we're growing this material. Um, stay in that stage of succession. And how do you prevent it from moving on? So we can do that. Um, so if we can maintain the soil structure, the way oxygen and water and root systems grow into, into that soil, we're going to maintain an optimal functioning. So it's exactly what Mother Nature designed. It's the way things work for, as far as we can tell, for the last billion years that plants with roots have been present on this planet. These are the ways that um, Mother Nature put them all together. And it's been working remarkably well till us humans came along. So we've got to put back what we broke. You're on mute, Adam. Thanks. Um, there's a story there that I love that you've reminded me of, Elaine, which is that plants weren't always on land. And those early soils and land we think were quite um, 
mineral and things were locked up really tightly, all the resources. And so there had to start to be this beautiful relationship between plants and microorganisms. And we see the, right around when, when plants were um, gaining the capacity to move from water systems where nutrients tend to be more flowy <laughs> naturally around the system onto those early soils, they had something like mycorrhizal fungi, right? They, they started to make these relationships with bacteria and other things so that there could be this accumulation of carbon. And I mean, I think it's worth saying, I'm not just being picky about terminology, but a lot of my friends that study soil carbon are, said, we really don't like the, the image that people get with sequestration. Like we're trying to take carbon and lock it up in a bank account and not have it, not have anything happen to it. Because it's actually like, the flow rate of carbon from the atmosphere into the soils needs to, we need to increase that flow rate and decrease the outflow rate. So it's really just holding the carbon there for longer. It's a, it's a carbon, it's the soil embracing the carbon, holding on a little longer. And we start to do that and we accumulate these um, values like the soil sponge works better the microorganisms are thriving, there's more of a food base, we're locking up toxins, we have access to, you know, the plants have access to nutrients and all. And um, it is absolutely what you're saying. It's like returning to the original story of how the plants got here is they and the microorganisms started accumulating the carbon in the soils. And then we did a lot uh, we took human beings made a lot of effort, many people, not everybody, not every culture, in saying, how can we get this, how can we chop this soil up and get this carbon to blow off? And, you know, it's like half of its original stock in many places, like in North America. So this is the work of our time, like you said, Anne. Let's, let's change the carbon flow rate and get that carbon into the soil. So that reminded me of this passage that I have marked because it's so awesome um, from Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. Um, really great book if you're into fungi, if you're into the science of fungi. Um, on page 198 at the middle of the top big paragraph, um, basically there's this idea that he says, what we call plants are in fact fungi that have evolved to farm algae and algae that have evolved to farm fungi. And so it's that reciprocity of like the relationship is so tightly woven that they are, they are each other. Like we are all connected. We are one this idea that like the original plants and fungi on, on, on the, on the surface of the planet outside the water, we're also in such um, tight collaboration. Someone asked, so what's the book, what's the book called? It's called Entangled Life by Merlin okay. Sheldrake. Great. Really, really you. good one. And he was one of our panelists in last year's Soil Summit, which many of those videos are still available um, through our website. Uh, okay, let's move on to another question from Donna. Is there a, a biomimicry application based on fungi or soil microbiology anatomy? Is there a biomimicry application based on fungi or soil microbiology and anatomy? I would say without even really knowing exactly which ones, yes, there absolutely is. Um, I think there's, and as I said, there's there's our, our literal sort of micrometer, like, you know, nanoscale um, innovation opportunities, but there's also the metaphorical and figurative um, social innovation work. Um, I actually did uh, for my, my final project uh, for my master's, I worked on a team and we pulled together a bunch of ideas around um, how does nature regenerate soil? And so, I mean, it's, it's really, the great thing about biomimicry applications is it's it's up to you to just go out there and either find stuff that people have already done or come up with stuff yourself. Really, you know, get creative and think about what are what's the function that you're trying to solve for 
and what in nature already does that function. And if you go to that website, asknature.org, you can actually search by function and you can see what some examples of organisms that do that function. And it explains how they do that function. And then you can think about how might I morph that into um, applying to applying that to my challenge. Um, so, I mean, I think there were, you know, as I said, even just the, <laughs> the, at the, at the radical mycology convergence, I did a talk uh, that was actually based around, um, Toby Herlick and, uh, Dana Baumeister's work on the characteristics of enduring partnerships. And actually that is available. I think if you just search characteristics of enduring partnerships, um, that work is available, but it's basically four pieces uh, that that really help us form our brains about relationships with each other and really quality long-term relationships. And um, so if we think about symbiosis and um, relying, you know, organisms relying on each other in relationship, um, they need to be able to supply different uh things to each other, whether that's services or products. Um, they need to be able to change with each other and with the changing uh, conditions of the world. There's there's four of them. It's really cool. It's it's some some of my favorite, uh, you know, social innovation work. It's really moving. Um, I think the people at the, at the workshop really enjoyed it too. So I highly suggest if you're looking for something um, that's very like human centric. Um, as far as an application here, that's a really good one to sort of zoom in and, and think about the relationships in your life. I was at that workshop. I loved it. I still have your sticker right here. Let's lichenize. And I think about this a lot with my coworkers. How can we be more like lichen? Yeah, I'm liking it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Elaine, well, did you have any thoughts on this question or should we head forward? Let's 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 keep going. Yeah. We we can we're spending too long to, on each one of these questions. So we gotta move along. Is okay, it my turn uh, to read it or yours? If you'd like to read it, hey. give me a break. <laughs> yeah. As biomimicry is adopted, what is nature as what we Hmm. What is nature as what we mimic? And what is nature as all our relations? In other words, what is the vision or thinking for this? How we see humans as of nature or our role? Is it like us returning or readopting? And I'm, I have the pictures of all, all of this in the way. Um, is it like us returning or readopting our rightful place? Or dot dot dot. I'm trying not to presume anything in the asking. So, and am so interested in the response to this of folks who are more deeply doing this work. Thanks from Judy. Awesome. This is a really great one. I think that it's really depends of course right as as most of those complex answers um tend to be um it depends on who the person is right um and so your perspective about biomimicry work might be that it is you know dudes in white lab coats you know doing innovation work or it could be on the other end of that spectrum, um, you know, more sort of spiritual reconnection with Earth as mother, with Earth as ourselves and each other. Um, and it's really, it's, it's open to all of us. Um, and so I think it's that idea of how can we be better neighbors to our human and non-human beings around us? Um, in, in ways that improve maybe the efficiency of the work that we do, but also, and, you know, basically give back in reciprocity to nature. Um, she has given us everything. And um, so how can we build back that relationship of recipro reciprocity and trust? Um, I don't know. Thoughts? Well, it, it's like when, um, when, we when we want stability within a system, we don't want to have our soil 
running down the hillside and into rivers and lakes and streams along with all kinds of toxic chemicals in that in that mix all we're doing is killing everything all the way down to the ocean and then you know that's that's uh, why Australia probably won't be there in too much longer is because we're losing the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so as all those, as we come to understand what we've been doing is very wrong, we will rethink our role and function and hopefully see that we have to nurture nature. Um, we don't really have a choice. Um, so what's the vision? that we think of here, it's to understand how nature works and put back into place what's going to work for us. This is great. And actually something pinged for me here, Anne, about what you said. Let me see if I can get back to it. So there's this vision, philosophical vision of taking the things that we already have in our society and reimagining them through this lens so that we're not using technology every day in our lives that the use thereof is like harming the planet, right? I think about the fact that, you know, like mining, for example, which goes on all over the world to give us these rare earth minerals so that we can have computers to get on zoom and talk about biomimicry. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> I don't want to make anybody feel bad. The, the, we have what we have now, but when this idea about readopting our rightful place is it, it takes individual and communal effort, internal, internal value systems to say, are we just going to, accept that it is the way it is and I'm a like a flea on the dog and I have no power or like the thing that you said about be a soil healer in the place that you're in and this mm -hmm. is what's so empowering about that is we, we can we can at least attain some measure of that rightful place right where we are right with what is in front of us right with with what each of us has for bandwidth in terms of time and resources and things. And if, if more and more people awaken to that in our society, we have more and more influence so that eventually the destructive things become abandoned and the, re and the regenerative things are ascendant. And I really am so glad that I've, I've gotten the view I've gotten in the last 10 or 15 years where like, I got interested in soil and then the whole world was like, yeah, this thing's important. <laughs> like it just, it happened right before my eyes where nobody was talking about soil. It didn't feel like except a few academics. And then now the FAO and other big groups are saying it's the year of soils. It's the you know day of soils, which is a little funny because every day should be soil day, but <laughs> it's, it's exciting to see that we are making moves against the destructiveness and, and reestablishing as individuals, as communities, as organizations, this rightful place where we're not destroying the planet, we're collaborating with every other living thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for the soapbox moment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Stephen said, I would be interested if you might suggest some solution for eliminating high scale lime in well water based on my biomimicry. So putting lime into well water to make it more drinkable or palatable. Um, what might be a more a way to, to do more biomimicry with that system? I don't think I have enough um, deep knowledge of the science of um the like how eliminating high scale lime in in nature works but again i would highly suggest that you check out asknature.org and um see what what's in there uh and and really maybe again look for what how does nature do this um and if you are you know if you have any sort of scientific background you can go on google scholar and um see if you can find um the function and do a little digging to see maybe uh 
maybe this is something for you to innovate. Could part of it be the problem that there's not a natural, I can't think of a natural system that sucks water straight out of the ground and puts it into like pipes right away. <laughs> maybe there needs to be some wetland area or some flow through compost system or some additive of humic acids that's from living things, right, Elaine, so that we can, I don't know, the, the whole, re, possibly a whole redesign of a water system from the traditional bore well into pipe system is what's going to be required here. Yeah, I uh, remember as a child, the, uh, you know, the water coming out of, out of our tap in Minnesota was uh, definitely hot, very, very hard water. And, uh, you know, you just got used to it. The, I, when I left Minnesota and um, hit soft water, it was like, bleh, this is horrible <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Give me my high scale lime, please. Um, so, you know, is it, we're, we're interested in not having the lime plugging up our pipes. Is, I think that's the main problem here, probably, Stefan. And I'm not uh, sure if they can answer, but I know yeah. it's a problem for people's washing machines and all kinds of things. Yep. And so, what would what could we find in the natural system that would neutralize that lime? Um, I would probably run it through compost and get the pH changed, um, get most of that lime. Um, sequestered uh, with the uh, uh, cation exchange capacity and uh, you'd probably be changing that um, compost fairly often it would mm -hmm. depend on just how high that um, is how much is a, a problem but I would probably start working with so uh, organic matter of some kind to see see if you couldn't get it to um, adhere to that uh, plant material and then you go out and you put your plant that material out on your property in a place where the, and the plants like high lime <laughs> few few holes maybe in my thought process but and and like uh anna said um yeah go find some books on the pro on the on this situation and see what you could put together yeah, at the end of the day, a big part of biomimicry seems to be the same as with the soil food web school methods, which is you got to mess around and find out. <laughs> <laughs> Throw this and that together and shake it and, you know, the next version and then the next thing. And we usually do find them. We find the answer. Absolutely. Okay, I think that if I stop sharing for a moment and reshare, we have a few more questions. I just have to load them up. This happens as we add slides at the end of our talks. So, and there was a question on the chat of whether or not there will be a copy of the chat available. And um, Sammy has been answering that. Okay, perfect. So, yes, uh, she actually gave people where to go to perfect. find it. it. You just have to give us a couple days. Um, it's not going to happen ho overnight. <laughs> Okay, here we are. How can we empower rematriation on a larger scale so we can assist and learn from nature and indigenous wisdom about biomimicry and regenerative principles not explored by the Western world? So I will let you all answer this because maybe the white guy doesn't need to answer it. I mean, I, I, I really, I love this question. I think it is absolutely imperative that we change the way that a lot of people see biomimicry, to be honest. Um, I am personally very interested in learning ways to weave indigenous wisdom in with the sort of modern scientific approach. Um, and actually this is some of the work of uh, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmer, um, and so she is she is trying to make sure that we can use um, indigenous knowledge alongside and inter interwoven with um, scientific experience and uh, 
theories and things. Um, but I think that it's a really important question to ask of like, first of all, what matters? Um, because I don't think that myself as a white woman can really say what the answer is. Um, I, I want to be part of supporting that work. Um, and I'm, I'd love to hear ideas or, but I think part of it is also supporting work that's already happening. Um, I, I don't need to be the one to spin up new ways to do this. Indigenous people are, are already trying to do this. And so how can I already, you know, support these already started programs, um, and, you know, have conversations with people who are talking about this work, um, and maybe sort of, widen our minds a little bit to make sure that we are uh, considering and including indigenous wisdom. Um, one of my favorite books is, is um, low tech design uh, for radical indigenism. It is a really fun book. Um, and it, it, I think it really does a great job at showing beautiful pictures and um, illustrations uh, about indigenous wisdom from around the world that, um, you know, doing, having wells in the desert. Hmm. How do they do that? Right. Um, and so I think there's really a lot to do a lot of work around this. Um, I'm having conversations with a couple different groups of people about how we can more fully, um, support, honor, acknowledge the indigenous wisdom holders as they've been doing this work for forever. Um, but also support those communities. Um, yeah, I don't know. I really appreciated that, Anne. Yep, you can't know everything. And so you give people where to go start. Absolutely. Okay. Um, how can media champion, champion the biomimicry mindset in our culture? Are there toolkits or resources to educate lifestyle journalists? Ooh, love it. Uh, that one's for you, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, media champion. So, you know, um, I'm also part of an organization called Biomimicry LA. We are a node of the global biomimicry network. Um, and so depending on where you live, there is probably a biomimicry node near you. Um, at my node, the executive director of, of the organization that I'm part of, um, Colin Mangham is really working on um, media and advertising and marketing and how, how might nature do that work? Um, you know, how can we really redesign the systems that we have to connect around communication um, and education? Um, and then again, uh, I mean, honestly, education around for lifestyle journalists, I would highly suggest that you reach out to biomimicry.org um, and because they really do focus on education of everybody <laughs> around biomimicry and they might have um, either some resources for you or who knows, maybe you guys can um, collaborate and uh, spin something up together. That's excellent. I am, um, I, through interacting with you and taking your workshop and looking at some of these web-based resources, I'm asking myself, how can I bring this lens to science communication? And a lot of it is, um, I have to be so in love with the things <laughs> that I'm talking about, right? I need to have a relationship with them. I need to really, you, you think of my science um, background as a way to just love more of the aspects of these microorganisms, of these plants, of the things around me, and, and bring that exuberance to the table. And I, I think that that's, I don't know, it, it might not be perfect, but it's a good direction to lean <laughs> in these things. Love life, love the world around you, love what nature has created in terms of wisdom and how we can be, um, how we're part of that process 
like yeah. like we've been the themes that we've been talking about today. And that that actually reminds me there's also this idea in biomimicry that we should bring a biologist to the design table. And that can happen in any industry. It can happen with any group um, any, you know, whether it's literal or metaphorical applications, um, so that you can ask those questions. Okay, I'm trying to solve for this function. What in your background does this function? Can you explain how that works? Can you simplify it so that I might be able to apply it as a template for my design solution? Um, so just interacting with biologists is fantastic. You can go to natural history museums. You can go to nature centers. Uh, if you find a really interesting article, a journal article online, and you might not have access to it, email that biologist. They are usually very happy to share an individual um, you know, copy of, of their uh, report with you, their, their journal article with you. And also they might be willing to answer some questions um, and sort of elaborate a bit on what they uh, studied. Wonderful. Um, I think that if it sounds all right with the two of you, we'll do maybe two more questions and then we might end a few minutes early today. Um, oh, this is one on quorum sensing. Quorum sensing in our soils occurs. Oh, I've got something in the way here. When molecules diffuse through the soil and reach a critical level that triggers a coordinated response from the community, how might we learn from this to contribute as individuals and groups to build support and trigger an, uh, to, a trigger to increase human response to climate change? Ooh, they're just really asking some good ones today. That's a spicy one. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, Elaine, did you want to start with this one or do you want me to jump in? Well, it's um, you, you have to know the hows and the whys and, um, you know, we've got to know what are the um, precise molecules that the quorum sensing is focusing in on before we could really know that what's happening in a human community to make a change is really something that could be called quorum sensing. So I, I kind of you know, as the biologist who wants to know why things work the way they do, so we get this right this next time around, um, it's it's problematical when you when we won't even admit that we probably have quorum, quorum sensing occurring all the time in our human communities. Yeah. Absolutely. I would agree. And, and sort of circling back on the last answer is my suggestion would be to connect with a soil biologist, or again, I've actually reached out to um, the author, uh, Dr. Seeley of Honeybee Democracy. And actually in that book, he talks about um, how we might be able to have better democracy decision-making, democratic decision-making um, in groups. Um, but yeah, if you have questions for a biologist, reach out to them because they can give you that detailed explanation of the how so that then you might be able to better understand how to apply it to your uh, solution set. I've got an idea on two levels here. One is the molecules diffusing through the soil. It, I think about, Anne, that you said you, you went to one of Elaine's workshops. And so it was like little packets of knowledge that were diffusing into the room that Elaine was sharing. And people walked away from that and they, they had their, their sense of the world elevated, changed, transformed. And then you're out there doing this work now and who are you influencing and how is that ripple moving forward? And so it's like the metaphorical kind of sensing <laughs> or molecular side. But then the other level is, um, I think about like on a, on a societal level with some of the theory of human decision-making, change, adoption of innovations, the kinds of things that we need to hit a critical mass of people that are interested in taking this kind of climate change mitigation seriously let's say putting more carbon in soil right getting getting that mechanism working again people yeah. are more likely to try things where someone more like them has told them hey this works and so it's that it's it's engaging with that wider community 
um, I will have less influence on what a farmer does on their land than another farmer will. And it's just always going to be that way unless I quit my job and I go start farming. <laughs> um, so I, I think understanding that everything we're doing is putting those molecules out there, but also we cannot talk to everybody effectively. We need to inspire more people from a, a diverse array of backgrounds and experiences so that they can reach people who um, think more like them that they can speak to in their, you know, their specific language. I think that that uh, your suggestion actually reminds me of an idea that I had a while ago. So we know that um, this, the the minerals are locked up on a soil particle, right? And then the microbes, the bacteria need to glue themselves to it and use their enzymes to unlock it and ingest it. And then they get swallowed by somebody else who gets swallowed by somebody else, right? The poop loop. Um, and so with that, I think a lot about what is locked up in our society. Mm. And a lot of that is scientific knowledge. Um, it's locked up behind, um, you know, uh, paywalls for, um, you know, scientific journals. Um, it's locked up behind academic, um, education behind like the, the cost of academic education. Right. Um, and so I think it's also our job as people who do have that access, have the privilege to access that information is to unlock as much of it as possible, digest it and put it out in a simpler form that is plant available. Right. So that the, the human <laughs> population of plants <laughs> might be able to more easily like take it in and, and, and use it for their work. Um, and so I think that might even be part of the work of our time is for those, those of us that do have that access to basically remove some of the gatekeeping to this information. Um, and that's what I love, honestly, about the Soil Food Web School. It is pricey, but like the amount of information that you actually get is kind of mind blowing and it really makes it accessible to anyone all over the globe. Thank yeah, you I for like that. the metaphor. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Except it does make me scared that I might have to dodge some protozoa coming after me to <laughs> eat me and release my science knowledge into the world. <laughs> Luckily, we're larger than flagellates. Thank goodness. Because it's kind of... For now. A, well... <laughs> you're planning on shrinking down? <laughs> Well, I just, I, I don't know what could happen in the future with, with pr those protozoa, but you're right for now, I'm not too scared of them. Well, yep. there's some of them I don't necessarily want in my body. 